Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin shortly. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will now begin. Please take your seats. Economies, governments, and societies across the globe are going digital. Almost half of the world's population is now connected to the internet. Digital transformation is challenging every aspect of the economy, government, and society, including their underlying structures. Can the traditional social contract prosper in an increasingly digital world? How could a modern social contract harness digital transformation to further economic opportunities? civic participation, and personal development. How can governments use digital technologies to improve the efficiency of public services and better respond to citizens' evolving expectations? Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The session will now begin. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our moderator for this session, consultant and career broadcast journalist, Udwak Amimo. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this session. It's a pleasure to be with you as your moderator. Now, it's been an interesting year when you think about all things uh, digital and social, whether Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, Google, the CEO, uh, testifying in Congress um, earlier in the week. We have a most illustrious panel convened to illuminate this issue. Let me invite them to join us, starting with Jamira Burley. She's the head of youth engagement and skills for the Global Business Coalition for Education. Jamira. Mr. Sanjoy Joshi, the chairman of the Observer Research Foundation. Welcome. <clears throat> Mr. Enrique Mendizabal, founder and director on Think Tanks. Welcome. And completing our lineup, we have Professor Lex Poulsen of Sciences Po in France. So let me just check, have you all downloaded the AD Connect app? You have, well done. Uh, please take out your uh, phones. Because what I'd like to do, before we hear from the uh, panelists, um, is to find out what you think about this topic, the digital age and social contracting. <clears throat> so, if you're ready, if I could have the uh, first uh, audience poll question um, on the screen. And the question is, do we need a new social contract for the digital age? Okay, you have 15 seconds to vote. Do we need a new social contract for the digital age? Oh, 
okay. Yes. And that's at uh, 70%. Okay, panelists, it doesn't seem like you've got a lot of work to do, um, but uh, we will um, try to unpack this further because we have 30% of people who say, no, we don't need um, a, a new social contract. So I'll start with you, Lex. Um, drawing on your experience, your background, take us back into history um, to help us understand social contracting, what it means, why it matters. Thanks. So, uh Round about the beginning of the, of the modern, we call the modern age of philosophy in the 16 and 1700s, they were trying to solve a problem related to politics. And the problem is this, what justifies power? And so the idea of the social contract was created as a way of understanding, uh, well, power is exercised because there's an agreement. Now, people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who popularized the term contrat social, uh, but was one of really a stream of thinkers along with Thomas Hobbes and, and John Locke were trying to basically solve this same problem. If there could be said to be an agreement that justifies the use of power, is it a real agreement? Do people actually have to sign something? Uh, is it an understood agreement that we pretend exists or that pretend happened sometime back in history? Um, so these are some of the problems with the idea of a social contract that were present at the very beginning. And I think what's interesting about the idea of a social contract now for, for digital age is that it's a term that we're taking from this very specific historical moment in European thought that came predominantly from England and France. Uh, and it was those countries that generated the model of representative government, which is now we see in crisis. And so a question that I pose myself is, do we use the same terms essentially that got us into this mess to get us out of it? Okay, um, you talk about messes. And if we look at messes, this year presented so many um, opportunities um, you know, for messing up, but also actual messes. So Enrique, are these messes the result of um, an outdated, obsolete social contract? Um, I, d I, don't, I don't know if it's an updated, obsolete social contract. What I'd say is a, it's a social contract that never really matured. Um, the, me the mess, I think, of the Latin Americans in the room would recognize that last year, uh, has been building up, but last year for some of us has, have been, has been quite a traumatic year, a year when it comes to a relationship with the state or with a relationship with institutions uh, of democracy or of the state. Um, in Peru in particular, and I'll talk from the Peruvian point of view, we have um, lost our trust in, in Congress uh, to the point where we have just voted in a referendum to, um, to ban re-election of parliamentarians, which is, uh, goes against the trend, but uh, such as the uh, rejection of, uh, of Congress. Uh, we have lost tr trust in the judiciary. Uh, we have also gone through a referendum to completely overhaul the judiciary because it has been involved in corruption. We have lost trust in the private sector, Odebrecht, OAS, and other Brazilian companies, plus Peruvian companies who are participating in these massive, act, massive corruption have made the private sector, um, once again, probably in the history of Latin America, the enemy in the eyes of many people. We've lost trust in the church uh, through a range of reasons, um, including uh, uh, sexual abuses um, and corruption as well, and we've lost uh, trust in, um, in, in, in the government, we've had a uh, change in government as well. So um, this social contract, uh, which probably we refer in a cosmopolitan context, in Lima mostly, not, not in rural areas, um, never came to maturity and we are rejecting it. Uh, and we just know, we do not know what else is gonna come uh, after this. But we certainly lost trust in every single institution out there, except, funnily enough, uh, in investigative journalism that has given us the information that uh, we have today and that we're using to uh, make up minds about these other institutions. Okay, um, that, that's interesting and I'd like to um, revisit that point later. Um, Jamira, Enrique talks a lot about the loss of trust and the loss of trust is seen a lot with your people, your generation, the emerging leaders, um, young people. To what extent um, do you think that social contracting, whether outdated, whether not updated, is still relevant as we, you know, um, you know, go bravely into this new digital age. Yeah, I think what's really interesting is that at this very moment in history, the world is dealing with this largest population of young people we have ever seen. 
1.8 billion young people, most of them under the age of 30. And what is interesting about the millennial Gen Zers is that they really feel a direct connection to change the environment in which that they live in because they don't trust governments, they don't trust businesses, they don't trust these traditional institutions to do what's right. And I think if we're going to have a social contract, it has to be updated. It has to be one that has young people at the table to actually design what it looks like. And it has to take into consideration their true concerns for the very institutions that hold so much power and that doesn't evenly distribute it to the people who are most <coughs> impacted, which are the marginalized populations around the world, particularly in countries like Africa, um, or I should say the regions like Africa. So I think it's really important that we um, bring young people to the table, not look at them as, as a monolithic generation, um, and allow them to really be the authors of this new contract that allows for more comprehensive um, intergenerational dialogue for solution-driven action. Okay. Um, so enjoy this uh, panel uh, builds on the previous one because we heard a lot about th the term social contracting wasn't used, but we heard about this new world order and, and, and Western governments being slow to adapt. So to what extent is social contracting, um, the, the lack of it, um, down to um, human beings being outpaced by technological innovation or just not ready to deal with the pace? Of, um, of, of this uh, innovation? Uh, thanks. You know, the way the world is going and the way we are deglobalizing, in a few years from now, my fear is that the only truly globalized entities are going to be terror networks, drug cartels, and uh, uh, human traffickers. The rest would just have splintered up at a time when the world is needing more of global governance. We are seeing far less of it. Now, that brings us to the whole issue of contracting. Now, who are we contracting with? Who are the contracting parties? Uh, Jumeirah spoke about power. Power is a very important relationship in any contract, in any contractual relationship. Today, we are in a world where power itself is extremely diffuse. You are living in a diffused power world where power is amorphous. And that is fundamentally what digitalization has done to the world, created these several entities. On the one hand, you have uh, uh, the, the, the uh, corporations, which are existing, having control over data. On the other hand, you have uh, you know, young net networks of young people working around, uh, getting together, social enterprises coming up. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of dynamism. They're demanding a greater voice. So who are the contracting parties? The old relationship between the state and state-led institutions and citizens is under distress. So while it is easy to say, yes, we need a new, new social contract, you know, getting into the nitty gritties of it, contracting parties, niche of contract, that is where we actually need to get into the harder discussion. Well, I'll follow that up um, with you because we saw, for instance, earlier this year, the European Union rolling out this um, GDPR, privacy. Um, we hear about data breaches. Uh, Enrique, you seem like you want to uh, jump in. What challenges, what opportunities are we um, overlooking, Sanjoy? See, Richard Mason, 1986, came out very clearly with the acronym PAPA, the four core pillars. Uh, and I'll tell you what the problem is. As far as the four core pillars are concerned, you have, uh, everyone thinks, OK, the first P is privacy, accuracy, property, and access. Now, when you look at different countries, emerged, emerging economies, de de developed economies, the priorities they accord to these four pillars, or the ethical basis of uh, the entire digital age are very different. Uh, for example, Europe values the first P, that is number one. Privacy becomes predominant. If you look at the emerging world, look at, look at Africa, look at India. For them, the value is on the last A, access. That becomes priority number one. See, privacy comes second. Much be much more the, the, the thrust of the entire exercise there is to get as many people connected as you can. Because the digital divide, like all technology divides, and it is worse than most technology divides in the past, because the digital divide is one divide that not just widens, it deepens with every shift in technology. Every time you know, Apple brings out a new model, there are some people which are going to be left behind. And access at a time when access to health, access to education, access to governance, is going to be restricted by the platforms on which you're operating upon. Even the simple matter of calling an ambulance depends on whether you're using a 2G phone or a 5G-enabled telephone. 
So that is fundamentally the issue of access which needs to be resolved. Enrique, you had uh, you, you wanted to jump in on inclusion yeah. and access. Uh, I, I was I was commenting on the uh, on, on going through the GPRS uh, process, but but uh, on access, and I I know we're talking about digital, but I think one of the problems with the social contract or whatever it was up up to now is that there are many people who have left behind regardless of digital progress, right? So there are many people who can still not call an ambulance whether they have a phone or not, and they will never be able to call one because there's no service available for them uh, where they live, right? Education, health, um, security, uh, etc. it's not there. And I think, uh, I think that's one of the things we have to uh, address when we're talking about the impact of digital technologies of the digital world um, on the world is that the 50% number quoted, it's a, it's a global figure. If you go country by country and you go within the countries, you'll find that um, in developing countries, certainly in Africa, certainly in Latin America, and, and in Asia, the majority of the people do not have um, use, you know, reliant use of the internet and all, all those, those possibilities. Um, so I think we have to be careful that we don't sort of jump onto the hype. Of, uh, of what digital technologies can do. Jamira? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there, there's a whole bunch of points that I wanted to grab onto, but I think the biggest one for me is that even when you talk about access, is this idea that even those who have access, who can make a telephone call, they might not even understand what they have and the ability to differentiate information because there's so much information out there. We talk in the U.S. a lot about fake news. A lot of it isn't fake news. There's just so much noise and the average person cannot decipher and, mm. and weave through all the information and make a conscious decision. So I think the biggest thing for me is how do we educate young people across generations, but also um, people to be able to understand the information that's in front of them, make sound decisions, even if and when they have access to that technology to do so. Okay, fine. So this is interesting. So we've talked about, you know, access, you know, technology, technological inequality, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about, you know, educating people to make sense of um, uh, technology um, and, and accessing services. But Lex, you have, um, um, you know, We've been talking, we've been seeing, and I think the previous panel referred to this, you know, um, populists all over the world mobilizing using technology. Um, typically authoritarian governments, if they're trying to shut something down, a protest, shut down the internet. They shut down technological access. Hmm. Um, what does this portend for the relationship between citizens and the state, which is the basis of the social contract? Well, we... Well, there, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. It picks up on what Sanjoy is saying. Is a, a contract, the idea of a contract is it's between different parties. The, the concept of a social contract was created to justify inherited power, to justify the inherited power of kings and queens mm -hmm. and the inherited economic power of an aristocracy. Now, I, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a little bit incomplete to say that power is more diffused now because of digital technology. No, power is more concentrated now, at least in the US and in many developed countries, there is more and more economic power and political power in fewer and fewer hands. Now, it is also the case that these technologies pr provide the promise of extending the circle of power, but that's not the reality, uh, at least certainly not in, in the home country of, of, of Jamir and I. But to, to get to your question about how, what are the possibilities of changing the relationship through technology between citizen and government. I would, I would say there's one very big mistake that governments are making right now, to think that, well, social media will create a new form of democracy between citizens and government. Well, it's a fundamental mistake to say that Facebook is, uh, gives rise to democracy. Why? For a collective intelligence to exist, you need to ha be able to gather data, to see what's going on. You need to be able to analyze that. You need to be able to make community decisions, deliberate and decide, and you need to be able to act. Well, I was with the Gilets Jaunes you know, last week to But you need to it. not sell the data to um, well, that's, that's political lobbyists. A very, a very good point. <laughs> but, but the mistake that I think the governments make is thinking that Facebook, because I'm seeing in real time people commenting, that I have an idea of what a representative sample of the public thinks. No, Facebook is very good at letting people coordinate a, a protest Right? which is why authoritarian governments want to, want to shut it down. Facebook is very bad at having a structured representative conversation that because can produce an agenda. it's curated to you specifically, and you don't have a wide range of understanding of what's happening beyond your own community. And so I think that is really the The struggle. echo chamber. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sanjay, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Uh, no, I wanted to come in on the whole, uh, the issue of access. Okay. Uh, when I speak about access, what I'm fundamentally saying is, uh, let me give an example. 
Uh, India today has a population of about 1.28 billion. That's the number we're talking about. Mobile telephone connections are about 1.2 billion, which are bare bones mobile connections. But most people would probably be using two, three, four mobile phones. That's why the number is so large. Talk of internet connectivity. The number falls to 3 million, of which 2.8 connect on mobile devices and just about 20 million connect on uh, actually broadband connections. So when we start talking of differential access, and you see many of these countries, including Africa, including India, are today talking about delivering governance, basic fundamental services, direct benefit transfers, subsidies, uh, the fundamental uh, public distribution system, where they're getting access to food. I'm talking at a very basic level, whether they can go to the ration shop and get, get their rations, whether they can get their uh, old age pensions. Now, all this is depending upon them being digitally connected. Now, that, has become, that is the danger that they can get left out. And that is why access becomes extremely important when we talk of, you know, when we talk of the four pillars and the whole debate between how important privacy is. There are big debates taking place in India on that issue as well, which, we, which, which I can come on to later. But that is the, how I would like to frame the question of access. Okay, thank you. So audience, I'd like to come to you now because there's a broad consensus um, and I see that you know, people already want to ask questions. I'll give you a minute. Um, I want your um, opinions um, and you're going to do that through the AD Connect, the Word Cloud app. And the question is this, what areas given the broad consensus uh, around the need for a new social contract, uh, what areas should a new social contract for the digital age cover? And you have 45 seconds. Um, <laughs> sorry, is there some confusion? Words, keywords. Democracy. Yeah, what issues? <laughs> yeah? Do, you know, um, should this new social contract for the digital age cover? Data. Personal, personal data. Personal data. It's funny, Sanjay was talking about public services and inclusion and access, and I'm not seeing, wow, privacy. This is kind of fun. my glasses. Probably need stronger glasses. It might be the Wi-Fi. Reliable, inclusion, news, bias. Reliable, inclusiveness. Diversity, fintech. 20 seconds to go. Security. Inclusion, surveillance, consent. Pensions. Diversity. Participation. Five seconds. Diversity. Object. Health. Health. Inclusion. Identity theft. And we're done. Okay. Well, privacy is a big one. Privacy is a big one. I'm, yeah. Um, panelists, what do you make of this? Um, if I were to work my way down, I'm starting with Lex. What do you, what do you make of this? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's clear that people feel most disempowered, this question of power, around who sees what about me. This is why privacy is probably the number one issue um, that I, I defer to, to Jamira that, that, that I certainly hear about when I talk to young people worried about regulating technology. In, in Europe, there's an understanding that the government has a role to play. In America, that's very contested. Um, no, 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 of course, I go on Facebook, they should know everything about me because we're Americans, it's a free market, and that's, that's how it goes. So I think that there's a younger generation, perhaps, that is resistant to that idea, that's much more open to a hands-on approach and, and taking more of a European attitude towards counterbalancing the power of these big media tech platforms to uh, control us, to deliver algorithms to us, and to understand uh, you know, what we're clicking on. Okay, Enrique, what do you think? Because privacy shows up in different ways. Identity theft, personal data. Um, are you surprised by this? Uh, no, no, I'm not very surprised. But, um, but I think that my, my reaction to this is that um, at, at least in the developing world, um, we, are fo we, we are followers in this, in this field. Um, whether it's the European approach or the American approach or the Chinese approach, as was mentioned uh, before, on the use of data. But we tend to follow. Uh, we're not doing, and I work with policy research organizations around the world, particularly in think tanks in developing countries, and this is not on their research agenda. This is not on their funders' research agenda. This is something that is being studied, st started to be studied in the US, in Europe, but it's not being studied in Latin America, across Africa, or Asia. Um, with the importance that we might think it, uh, it, it should have. And I think that's one of the key challenges 
in, in coming up with a, with a word cloud, in coming up with an answer to a question, in understanding less uh, 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 accurate uh, uh, representation of what, of what goes on in, in, in your question about who, who are we contracting with or between, um, we, we are not asking that question ourselves. Uh, we are sort of waiting for uh, the US, Europe, China maybe to answer the question and then we'll choose who to follow and that's dangerous. Mm. Sanjay, are you disappointed that um, participation um, isn't such a priority? I think all of these encapsulate participation. I mean, this cannot be without participation of people, whether you're talking of even privacy. Privacy is an issue of participation, about who controls whose data. Uh, and let us please understand the whole issue of privacy in a, in a slightly different context. Now, the normal approach towards data is, and it's a very common debate which is started today, the data is a new oil. It is like a resource. I know there are fundamental problems with that approach. Data cannot be a resource in the same sense that oil is a resource. Because once you get into that, then in many countries, the government starts trying to control that resource. And that perhaps becomes as dangerous as when Facebook starts trying to control it. But hasn't Facebook already been controlling it? Facebook and other social uh, media platforms, they've been selling our data for years. So why is it a problem for governments to um, have access to this resource, but not for corporates? Mm. The debate started in the US with, Wikipedia, uh, with WikiLeaks as to how much access governments can have to your own personal data, what they do with it. And then, yes, uh, companies like Facebook started reforming how they treated data and who, who had access to it. So this, but, the, yeah, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I was like, the difference between a corporation having access to your data versus government is the fact that you, to some extent, you have chosen your leaders. And so there is a clear understanding of what you think your leaders will and won't do with that data versus a corporation. But that's part of the social contract, isn't it? Yeah, that is a part of the social contract. Is participation, is you actually making the dis conscious decision with the information you have to be able to fully understand who has your best interest at heart versus who is trying to make a, the buck, right? Yeah, the dollar. Just in India, the debate was about government control of data on the entire Aadhaar platform. It became a very, very strong privacy debate as to what kind of data was the government control went into the Supreme Court for litigation. And eventually, the Supreme Court laid down strict guidelines on what could be done with the data, what could not be done with the data. They veered more towards the GDPR format, which is the, which is the European format for data protection. Uh, but the problem, again, was that when the legislation comes out, then you have a regulator who is actually a fiduciary in charge of the data. And the relationship of that fiduciary with the government is not very clear in the law. So that debate is very much alive even in democracies, whether it be the United States, whether it be in India, it's a very, very live debate. Jamira, what so, did you think? Because uh, on the word cloud, again, um, personal privacy um, data, um, and yet you're championing social um, justice, you're working for young people, skills. And there was a tiny, tiny bit there that talked about pensions. Mm -hmm. And part of the uh, social contracting of old was that our parents' generation would go to work, they'd work in the same company for 55 years or however long, they'd retire with a pension that would see them into their glorious sunset years. We are not assured of that anymore, given the gig economy, freelancing, um, the, fourth, the digital age that we're talking about, and the fact that the nature of work is changing. No, I fully agree. I could never imagine myself working anywhere for 40, 50 years. Like, I, I can't visualize that. And most of my friends wouldn't stay at a job longer than two or three years. So when you talk about the evolution of a contract, you also have to take into consideration the current context in which your citizens live in and their expectations that they have for themselves and the government. And so I think if we're going to create a structure that actually allows for people to be able to thrive and prosper, then retirement has to change with the people and, and, and the conditions in which they live. But I think the important, the one thing that's missing around on why data is such a huge thing for most people is the fact that you have elected officials who are so old, no shade, but who are so old who don't understand technology. And we saw that this week with the Google CEO in Congress. A Congress member saying the Google. 
the Facebook. <laughs> like many of these individuals don't even use it themselves. So I think we need to have representatives who actually use technology, understand the language, understand the current context in which their citizens live and are able to make sound decisions. That means we need younger, smarter, innovative people in office for intergenerational dialogue, you know, okay. just and, move out of the way. And so that comes back to democracy and the nature of it and yeah. how um, digital technologies are um, impacting on the nature of um, governance. Um, what should a new social contract look like um, for um, politics in the digital age? I'd say one, <clears throat> one thing in particular is that, again, remembering the roots of the idea of social contract, it was to justify people in power, mm -hmm. right, who were the people who had been in power for centuries. If we're going to have a new social contract, it's not going to be between a ruling class in Washington, D.C., Brussels, and Paris. But wasn't also part of the social contract that um, we are ceding some of our personal um, space to this you know, powerful entity in return for um, a retirement package, in return for security, in return for mortgages, in return for um, free services. That was part of it, well, wasn't it's certainly it? Well, it's certainly what the people who are running that powerful entity wants, wants you to you know, believe. I think it comes back to Sanjoy's question. It's, who is it a contract with? Frankly, I don't want to see a new social contract that perpetuates a system where elites decide uh, economic and political elites decide who gets to see your data, uh, what, you know, what uh, access, what infrastructure is created to give more people access. No, I think if there's going to be a new social contract, it's not going to be between citizens and the political and economic elite, but between citizens and each other. That, I think, is a powerful idea, because right now, as you know, my, my panelists, my fellow panelists have said, there's a crisis of trust. And we cannot create new agreements uh, with people who don't trust each other. You don't, you don't enter an agreement with someone you can't trust. You don't make a contract with someone you don't trust. So if there is going to be a social contract, it's not going to be between a power elite in Paris, Brussels, and Washington, D.C., and everybody else, but between citizens and each other. That, I think, is a promising idea. Across borders. Across borders. Thank you. What would that look like if you have Mark Zuckerberg refusing to appear before the British Parliament um, and various other, uh, you know, corporate citizens refusing to, um, to, to, to appear in different political jurisdictions even though they sell their services in those jurisdictions? Well, I think we're just starting to find out. I mean, the, the, the answer is we are just at this fork in the road between the Enlightenment representative model, uh, which we, I think we can agree is in a terminal crisis, and either going in the direction of China and citizen scores, or going in a direction of a more horizontal, participatory, collectively intelligent society. And we're just at the beginning of that, of that choice. So either we continue to cede power to the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, or you have these new networks working across the, the private, public, NGO sector, cities working together like the C40 group that is taking action uh, against climate change, uh, creating new models of governance that break down the old categories. That is the only option that's available to us. Okay, and Enrique, what would that look like? You know, when you talk about civic participation, um, service delivery, what would, what would the new... I think we, might, we might need to wait for the next season of Black Mirror to find out. <laughs> but but um, on, a, on, a more, on a more practical note, which might be a way into this, um, the Royal Society of Arts, um, I think it was this year, last year, uh, undertook a large uh, report on the future of work. And one of the things that uh, they were looking at, it, it was in the UK, but in conversation with Matthew Taylor, in thinking about countries like Peru or um, developing countries where you still have a, a vast majority of the population outside the formal sector, platforms like, uh, like Uber, where, which in the UK or in Italy or in Germany, are a threat to the formal sector, you know, the, the, the black apps. Um, in our countries, there might be an opportunity to bring people into the formal sector because the people who, who work in there can be taxed, pre-taxed. And if you start pre-taxing people, if you start taxing people, you start including them into that aspect of the formal economy, then you might have greater interest in participation. You might have greater interest in those who represent you. So there might be a way of bringing into our democratic institutions or discussions, about 70% of the population that currently lives almost entirely in the informal sector and is therefore not taxed and therefore has very little interest in participation in the same way maybe that those few that are taxed, especially the corporations have, in engaging with, uh, with the government. So it sounds therefore like uh, our countries in the developing world are failing to take advantage of the, of the opportunities of the digital age um, in waiting for China, the US, and various others. Because we're not, we're, not, we're not studying these opportunities. We're treating them as something that might be too complex or might be something we don't have any power 
to address. Let's wait until they decide how they're going to deal with Ubers and, and, uh, and others, um, Airbnb, and then we'll follow. Rather than saying, well, how can I work, how am I going to use this to help us in our situation? Okay, thank you. Look, I know there's great interest. Yes, um, their hands up. Hands. Um, oh, lots of hands up. So why don't we do this? We'll, 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 you know, this, we'll, we'll try and make this as inclusive as possible um, in a democratic uh, fashion. So I'll start with this side, come to this side, and then that side, and that way, hopefully, we'll have some sort of representation. Okay? Um, so, yes. May I ask you to be brief? Tell us who you are and get to the point. Just, uh, je vais poser une question brève parce que je suis journaliste. En fait, je voudrais savoir uh, la menace à la vie privée. Si elle vient principalement des États, programme de surveillance, ou si elle, euh, elle est beaucoup plus grave avec les groupes privés, euh, notamment les groupes des réseaux sociaux, qui eux aussi font de la surveillance à notre insu. Merci. Thank you. Next. Okay. Uh, let's. Someone here has. Okay. Hi, I'm from Argentina. My question is: uh, this competition between the governments and big tech companies are kind of taking care of the privacy issues by now. But in the future, what are citizens willing to do to protect their own privacy uh, without losing all the advantages that the, the technology uh, has given them in the, in the last years? Okay, pass the microphone next to you. You had a question? Well. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Nuhu I come from Tanzania. I just want to challenge the panel. We have, they have really brought the negative sides but there's very few ideas on the positive side of the digital aid that we're actually observing. Because if there is a technology that is spread to people very quickly, is this one. Uh, even when we talk about 50%, it is still very, very fast compared to other technologies. So there are a lot of positive things that actually are happening that we can put into use, but the panel is not talking about that. Okay, thank you. Sir? It's actually me. Thank you. This is a whole line of people had questions. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm uh, from the Dominican Republic. I'm in Chileno. Uh, quick question about data. Um, artificial intelligence is, is a big thing right now. And, yeah. and it, it is acquiring uh, even a geopolitical sense for some uh, analysts. We all know the story of China and the U.S. How do you think data, whether you like it or not, is going to become an object of competition in this great... Uh, struggle that we see between China and the U.S. because obviously yeah. wh whoever leads in artificial intelligence will need a lot of data and China seems to be up in the game. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, mine is just to contribute to uh, something that uh, you mentioned in passing. My name is Jacob from uh, Kenya and uh, mine is different because... Uh, the Jacob, ask a question. Uh, it's not a question. It's a so comment. Then, cool. Yes, uh, what I'm saying is tech can be used to change the narrative in the developing nations, like in the case of Kenya, where M-Pesa has been used to change the narrative, that government can actually join in tech to bring efficient services, whereby through M-Pesa you can access all government services and cut the chain that always brings corruption in the, in, uh, in, in the countries that Africa is facing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a very quick question. I'm Scarlett Varga. I am one of the emerging leaders. Um, I was the one who put the pension word in, and I'm very curious about this, if everybody could address it very briefly. We talk a lot about welfare state in Europe, and we try to understand how to support the youth, because we expect the youth to be the you know, entrepreneurs of the future. But, you know, I am one of them, hopefully, and I'm thinking about my health policy, my pension, and so on, and I'm not alone. So uh, do you think that, you know, there is an opportunity there to revive a new type of welfare policy? Um, because there are so many, you know, even with old welfare policy, there were so many questions that were not resolved. Okay. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity to, you know, have a new one out there. We have three. I'll take one from you. Okay. Uh, Eric Tumba, uh, I'm an alumni of the Emerging Leader Program. My question is fundamental. Uh, the underlying assumption is that uh, we are all almost already in the digital edge, and therefore we need to draft a new social contract. But the reality on the ground is you have people that are still in the stone edge, people who are still in the pre-industrial edge, people who are still in the pre-modern edge. The panelists made that point. What's your question? My question is, do you really think that 
uh, technology and data will solve everything. Like we just dish out tablets to kids in the desert without a teacher and they become as brilliant as Zuckerberg. Because this is uh, what seems to become the currency okay, of the day. Thank you very much. Let's get some responses to that and then I'll come back to this side of the room. Thank you. Um, so there were several questions. Um, rather than all of you answering the same question, could you just answer the questions that you feel strongly about? Um, uh, and so there was um, pensions uh, versus welfare, the welfare state, Sonjoy. Um, Argentina, um, citizens, how can they protect? I like the last one. No, you, you want that one as well? No, no, the, 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 la the one the, about, This one. Yeah. I was coming to that. Technology is a silver bullet, Enrique. And um, data is an object of competition. I'm not sure who's... Sonjoy, okay. Great. Go ahead, please. On, on the question of pensions and the welfare status, that's a very fundamental question of the social contract which we're debating. Are we going to see more of the state or are we going to see less of the state in the digital world? If you move into the gig economy and jobs become completely unformalized, then the kind of uh, umbrella protection policies which most factories, companies used to give in the old age, in the industrial age, cease to exist. That also has an impact on family life. That's, that has an impact on how societies interact with each other. So does that mean that we are now asking for the state to come in in a greater measure as a welfare state, which then brings a far greater role than many countries would like it to have? So that is a fundamental question of the social contract. Or would we be expecting uh, other, format of, uh, you know, other formats to develop, social systems to develop, which could be cloud-based or some, you know, based uh, social enterprises being based in the cloud, which start substituting services for uh, insurance, health, mm -hmm. continuing education, which is a very fundamental uh, need of modern times. You know, you know, your education does not end with school and college. It is a lifelong experience. You need to keep on modifying, changing, learning new things, because that is the shape of the new economy which is going to come. So these are precisely the questions which will need to be debated when we get into the whole issue of the social contract on uh, data competition. Data competition is very, very real, yes. And data competition is the one fundamental fact which puts under stress a lot of the rules and regulations, a lot of the laws, which are trying to come about in various jurisdictions, including the US, uh, uh, the EU, and in China. China, yes, because of the quantity of data and the quality of data because of the laws. You know, their, their data, there is no question of there being any false data. It is genuine, authentic data. The algorithms, the surveillance algorithms that run on the data are going to be the best in the world. So as far as AI goes, they, will, they are taking a leap ahead of everybody else. Now, this is extreme competition which is going to be taking place. How do other societies learn to cope with it? That is something we will, we will, we will have to handle. Okay. Uh, Jamira? Yes, um, two points that I would like to make. First, in regards to um, welfare, I think so half of, half of 1.8 billion young people are not on track to receive the skills they need by 2030 to actually enter the workforce. Oftentimes, we look at artificial intelligence, robotics, as removing jobs from the market. It will also be replaced with new jobs. So the goal isn't to say, automatically government, government needs to come in and hand people checks. The goal is to say, how can governments work with businesses to redesign curriculum to actually teach young people ahead of time so that they are able to fully participate in society by getting a job in this new economy. The last thing I'll say is in regards to artificial intelligence. The biggest thing that I fear with artificial intelligence and data is the fact that oftentimes Robotics, artificial intelligence adapts the same prejudice of its makers. And so we need to have accountability mechanisms in place to ensure that this new gig economy, the technology that's being developed, doesn't actually inherently oppress populations, again, just like humans. Thank you. Enrique, technology is a civil bullet. Yeah, so you asked whether technology can solve solve everything. I think it's I think the answer would probably be no, but it um, it leads us to a uh, um, providing a warning to, to, to the way we address some of these issues. I think, again, from the point of view of a developing country, I think we are talking about artificial intelligence, gay economy, but we're not necessarily understanding what it all implies. And a very good example of this, sometime in 2007, 2008, a very smart, very well-meaning uh, officer in the Ministry of Education in Peru traveled to Davos, uh, listened to Mr. Negroponte talk about the One Laptop Per Child program, came back convinced that this was going to solve a serious problem in Peru, that is we cannot get good teachers and materials and education to very isolated areas and rural, rural communities. 
So Peru became an early adopter of this, uh, of this initiative, bought 900,000 computers, a uh, program that ended up costing about four, $400 million. But no pilot, no reflection on whether there was going to be electricity or not in the communities, no reflection about whether there was going to be Wi-Fi, so they had to use dongles and USB cards, which made it more expensive. No engagement with teachers who had to, somebody had to receive these computers and who didn't want to use them because they didn't understand how to use them. And if you are a teacher, you know you don't want to look like you don't know how to use something in front of your students. No engagement with parents who refused to accept the computers because what happens if they broke? Who was going to be responsible about this? So for not having done your homework, we ended up wasting 400 million without considering the opportunity cost of those resources. So I think technology can be an excellent tool if only we incorporate all these other sciences that we've been developing over a very long time and start studying our own context, not the big data, but what a colleague of mine called the big data, the detail of these communities, what their lives are like before we try to introduce technology to solve these problems. And that is the role for think tanks, for research centers, for universities around the developing world. And we need to study this a lot more before we start making very expensive decisions. Okay, and welcome to the university, Sciences Po. Um, there's a question about citizens and how um, to continue to access government services while uh, maintaining, while protecting their data. There's also a question from the gentleman in, in, in French, which I wasn't wearing my translation um, gear, so I didn't hear it. Et en fait, j'ai compris que vous êtes journaliste, mais j'ai pas entendu la, la question, en fait. <laughs> oui, c'est vrai. If we could just get the... Could you respond to the other question? Okay. Um, while we get the microphone to him. Thank uh, you. So, I... I, I uh, semble que uh, la menace à la vie privée ne provient pas seulement des États qui font, uh, parfois pour des raisons logiques et valables, la surveillance, les programmes de surveillance, Euh, même si les États, vous savez, il y a toujours un contre-pouvoir, une, une commission parlementaire peut écouter, par exemple, de, entendre un service de renseignement, par exemple. Par contre, il est avéré que tous les grands groupes, notamment les groupes dans, dans les, les réseaux sociaux, les groupes, font de la surveillance. Et même des groupes privés font aussi de la surveillance pour cibler une certaine clientèle, pour fabriquer des produits de grande consommation. Ma question est de savoir euh, lesquelles euh, de ces deux surveillances est la plus dangereuse pour le citoyen. Merci. Thank you. Euh, en fait, je ne suis vraiment pas expert dans cette, euh, de, cet aspect de la, de, de la chose, donc je suis peut-être la, la mauvaise personne pour répondre à cette, à cette question, mais je, euh, je reviens à ce... Maybe I switch back to English. To, to, I think there is something crucial uh, in the question that relates to what Enrique was talking about, about how to design policy. And I think that there is a techno-utopianism that comes from the private sector to say, we give the technology, boom, here are all these tools, go use them. Um, whereas I think Enrique points out that unless you design the policy with the key stakeholders, with the parents, with the teachers, with the people who are providing electricity to these areas, from the beginning, you're going to have a beautiful crate full of tablets that don't get used. Um, and so I think that one of the answers is citizens need to be brought in, not just at elections. Unfortunately, in the U.S., our you know, system right now is so heavily geared towards the election process that we think in terms of, well, involving citizens in running for office and, and voting for people. Well, I, I think all over the world we're seeing that citizens are being brought in, not just at elections, but to help design policies uh, to construct with the government and to give feedback in real time. As you say, if there had been a pilot, maybe they would have been able to prevent the disaster and waste a little bit less of the, of the public's money. And so I, I think the future in, uh, in dealing with some of these problems will come from not just the old people sitting in the, in the committee rooms, but the citizens directly affected by education, pr uh, privacy, pensions, from them in their communities, designing with them every step of the way the government response. Would that apply to the question about protecting your data? while still accessing government questions. Well, Sanjay, I think, made, made a really interesting point about that we don't have to rely on government to be the, the, the sole answer to, to that question. Tim Berners-Lee and his group um, uh, at MIT have, have been thinking about this idea of data pods. That would be, and maybe, Sanjay, you could speak to that, to that idea of, of, of an autonomous, uh, uh, citizen-driven way of, of, uh, of preserving and protecting personal data, which I'm sure you know more about than I do. Okay, I will come back to the floor, um, this side. Um, our, no, no, our democracy is skewed to this side of the room now. Um, there's a gentleman um, who's had his head up right there. Thank you. I'm afraid of Aladao, a professor at Sciences Po, too. <laughs> Hello. Uh, 
I, I just want to say that uh, uh, when, you, when you say that the control of data is the, name of, is the name of the game, the future name of the game, in my view, I think it's not that. The, the, the real thing is how do you innovate and create new ways of using the technology? And this, when you talk about China or other things, when, when you try to control the way that disruptive technology is going on and this permanent innovation goes on, you finish by stifling it. And what maybe is happening in China is you, you have one foot on the accelerator of disruptive technologies and the other on the, uh, on the brakes in order that they don't get disrupted themselves. And this kind of thing makes that societies and systems that don't have this freedom of innovation they start lagging behind whatever they do, even if they have fantastic uh, artificial intelligence. What artificial intelligence can create, it can destroy too. Yeah. And so uh, the problem is not data by itself. The problem is the inno permanently innovation process on how to use it. Electricity was known 100 years before uh, the mass production chains for okay. mass production, but it's only when it was applied there that it became really something. All right, then, thank you. Please pass the microphone behind you. Thank you. I'll, I'll try my best to be very brief. Well, uh, I think the speaker next to you... Uh, Lex. Who? Yes. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, he said uh, social media brings or creates informal democracy. Brings I mean, what? Creates or brings uh, informal democracy. Informal democracy. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. No, no, I said no, no. the opposite. He didn't say. Okay. Opposite. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> but, okay, let me come to the social media. Actually, it's related. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, yeah, I do, I do recognize the importance of social media in terms of development and uh, improvement of social life. But sometimes it's against when it comes especially specific uh, areas or localities where the citizens are not empowered, where when they are not responsible enough, it, it, it might create chaos. So don't you think that there should be revision of the social contract? That is the fact that I elected uh, a government or my representative does not mean that I have to be a free rider. So don't, don't you think there should be some sort of regulation even sometimes shutdown is also necessary if it is against the best interest of the society. I mean, that is my position. Okay. So what do you think? Thank you. Um, we'll move to this side of the room. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Kimaya, Liberia's ambassador to the United the Nations. Uh, having listened, uh, now and even in the future, the issue of control as it relates to data is key. Uh, it's not that as we saw from the exercise you gave, security uh, has to do with that. We live in a world of good and evil. So data can be used for good and for evil. So we respect the government, they won't leave data out because they need to control the data. But how that data, when it's for evil, or even court system litigation and what have you, that can be used. Now for privacy and the citizens or consumers are also keen about protection of their data from the standpoint of security as well. Because once you know all of my data, then I become vulnerable. So security is key. Thank you. Thank you. Young man back there, the glasses, and then the young man who's standing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ibrahim. I'm Nigerian. I live in Ethiopia. Uh, at the heart of the conversation on social contracts is legitimacy. Uh, and if you talk about legitimacy, I'm not just talking about legitimacy based on winning elections, but on legitimacy on the basis of the reliability of the state to deliver goods and services, so to say, to the citizens. Now, how do you cultivate you know, an ecosystem of that reliability in this digital age in a, in a system where there is an increasing clampdown on use of social media in many countries. You You're know, responding to the Ethiopian gentleman. Uh, not just okay. responding to him, but it's just a general question. Okay. You know, I mean, social media taxes, you know, issues around shutting down during elections and all of that. How do you strengthen social contracts in a system like that? Okay, thank you. 
And that will be the last question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I am Malik Abbadi. I am a junior researcher at the Policy Center for the New South and also the maddening voice that keeps telling you to take your seats. I have a question for uh, any member of our panel. We are seeing a certain devolution in uh, the protection of individuals, where what used to be the responsibility of the state is now the prerogative of the company. And so um, our protections with that are regressing. And I wonder, I'm, I'm failing to see an agent springing up to take the role of the guarantor of our protections within this, this devolution. And so I wonder how you see the, the framework of protections moving forward um, and who you see taking up this role of, of guarantor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's an interesting um, round of uh, questions we have. Um, the revision of the social contract, um, and that ties in with legitimacy. Um, Lex, w will you take that, please? Sure. So, so um, I think I fundamentally agree with your premise, uh, which is uh, returns to the same theme. You can't create a contract with someone you don't trust. Um, and right now, the people who are excluded from access to public services, from access to basic education. Uh, you know, why would they enter a new social contract with a government that has, has excluded them? So you know, to me, I think uh, there's only one way forward, which is to build power locally, to build power away from where the centers of power exist today. Uh, it's a long process. Uh, it requires a negotiation with existing power structures. I mean, I, I was trained as a community organizer and worked on the Obama campaign, and we saw that we could build power community by community by taking the, the least usual suspects, and the, their power lay in who they knew, their networks of influence, the resources they could marshal together, and the kind of self-driven community solutions. So I, I think it is possible, even in situations where there are oppressive governments who are denying people these basic rights to, uh, to work, especially across borders, which is what, which, you know, we, uh, to, to create power where it doesn't exist. Because simply reproducing the existing power structure is not going to solve the problem. Okay. Enrique, could you please um, address the question about um, social media uh, chaos? Um, if, uh, you know, will the governments have the right to turn off access? Um, you know, uh, during times of uh, crisis, but also if you could take a stab at who guarantees protection uh, in this new digital age. Um, I don't know if they have the right to turn off access, but it's a, you know, it's a service like any other service, right? You, you might decide to um, close, the, uh, close the restaurant because you don't like whether, you know, the quality of the food they're serving, I don't know. But uh, it's become, it's become a, almost a right of access, you know, we have the right to access and that's why we get, we get upset. But uh, I think, uh, isn't Again, the metaphor different? You have a right not to serve certain people because you don't like what they represent. Yeah, but the government, in you know, the government has a you know, governments in general have the power to regulate different sectors, and they can they can decide if the if the sector the, is providing the right service or not, and they have the right to intervene. It's just that with social media, we've become so so addictive to it uh, by design that we treat it as a right, that we have, we have the right to receive. And of course, it, it's a lifeline in many, in many ways, so it's, that's why it's such a difficult subject. But, but I, do, I don't think that our protection uh, is now in somebody else's hand. I think most of us, all, all of us, still live in nation states where the state has responsibility to protect us. And that's part of the original social contract, right? So, Pay your taxes, do what I tell you, but I'll protect you. Right? I'll fight wars for you. Uh, you know, now you make them fight as well. But uh, I'll protect our, our boundaries. I'll protect our borders. I'll give you security. And I think they still have that responsibility. And I do not think we're going to solve things through social entrepreneurship or through a few apps. We're going to solve these problems through public policy. And maybe to do that, we have to participate, engage in different ways. Um, maybe we do need to involve young people in different ways. There's an excellent initiative in Kenya uh, um, called Well Told Story that have been building up access with young people, not telling them, engage with us in our ways, and well, how do you want to engage? And then trying to share information. So there are ways in which you can get more people to participate, and I think that participation should lead to changes in policy because mm -hmm. those are going to be the transformative uh, uh, changes in the future. Not the social the app and the social, which are fine and nice, but they're going to 
give you access to a restaurant you know, at 2 a.m. in the morning. They're not going to address security. They're not going to address your rights. They're not going to address yeah. service, public, access to public services like healthcare or education at a massive level. And so that becomes the basis of my question to you, Sanjoy. How can we use um, digital technologies to enhance service del uh, public service delivery to citizens? Uh, my short answer is, I would endorse what was based from here. You see, this is not a bipolar debate between good and evil. The technology is only there, evil. Yeah. Technology is just a tool. And depends on how you're going to use it. Technology does empower. Uh, there are certain laws and legislations which are evolving over time. It is not that the negotiation process has ended. We are still negotiating with our governments. We are negotiating with our private companies. People are raising their voices in social media, on Facebook against Facebook. They, you know, on Twitter against Twitter. And companies are responding, governments are responding. So this negotiation must go on and people have to participate in this whole process. And this is the way we have to be moving forward. Because technology, yes, does empower, it, it gives in our hands the tools. And some will be negotiated through legislation, if a public policy comes in. Others will be negotiated through technology itself. In the future, you could have social media platforms. For example, some people are already talking about blockchain-based platforms, where you guarantee anonymity. But all the other concerns of, you know, uh, of, of your data being shared, of your data being leaked, of there being other concerns on privacy, automatically dissolve away. So there are certain solutions which technology itself will give. Certain solutions will have to be find in, found in law, policy, and legislation. We have to go on negotiating. Okay, and so Jamir, I'm coming to you. You wanted to step in. Yeah. This negotiation, what would it look like and how would it achieve um, social justice? Education, civic engagement. And I say that because any form of government we look around the world, the, the point in which people are able to stay in power is that they say, the citizens in which I oversee are too dumb or not smart enough to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. But yet there is no real investment in education or real investment in civic engagement. And a colleague of mine, CC Battle, runs a program called YP4, which is under the understanding that how do you equip young people with the tools and resources to make sound decisions so that way you don't have to say we need to all have a cookie cutter approach, but that you can look at a contract for Facebook or you can look at what you're signing up for and make a sound decision on whether or not you want to give your information freely or you want to put restrictions on that information. So I think for me, it's, it is about power, and we've mentioned this on this stage, but it's also about how do we just equip more informed and educated people to make sound decisions, both, both on who they elect, but also the, pro the product and services in which they consume. Mm. So look, we're winding up now, and I'd like to take your pulse again. And I'd like to do that by asking you to take out your phones, um, go on to AD Connect, and I've got two questions for you. One question you've already uh, responded to, I'm going to ask it again. And that question was, um, do, we need a new social contract? do we need a new social contract for the digital age? And you've got 15 seconds to vote. Um, do we need a new social contract for the digital age? Uh, please vote. Trying to influence everybody else. No opinion, no. You can't. You yeah. Pick a side. Yeah, you've got to pick a side. Somebody turned off the internet. Montague is in Okay, so we finished the voting. Let's see what that says. Yes. Look at this. Oh, wow. 82.3. Okay, fine. Um, we've, um, I've got another question for you. Um, so please put up the uh, second question. How urgent is the need for a new social contract? And it's uh, one, very urgent. We needed it yesterday. Two, urgent, need, uh, urgent enough, we need one in the next one to two years. And three, these things always sort themselves out according to the market. Okay, so you've got 15 seconds to vote on that. There should be one, none of the above. None of the above, okay. Um, well, no, I, I, pick a side. Let's see. What does this say? Good heavens, urgent enough? 57.4. I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised that we have 38% um, of people in this room saying that, you know, that they want the market to regulate this. So look, panelists, um, we're winding up now. Someone's had his hand up for a while. Um, ask your question very quickly. Hello, so I'm Ali from Tunisia. I'm, 
I'm working on uh, CEO of Evocraft, so uh, we are uh, including. Uh, we're winding uh, up it, all it, the it is very fast. We are including intelligence in uh, education uh, in uh, Africa. So uh, I realized that uh, should we uh, just uh, focusing on uh, making education smart, or it's, it's about making, uh, it's, or it's, it's about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, investing smart you know, on education. Okay. So we are on working on a project where we uh, uh, we we. Uh, just make a move, 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 moving schools that go to the regions. Sorry, I'm going and, to interrupt uh, you. Okay, um, there's plenty of time for you to talk to people about what you're okay. doing in Tunisia. Okay. Now is not the time because we're because winding up and we want to. Okay, okay, thank okay. you. Um, but panelists, we're winding up. Um, and you see the results. Um, the uh, previous poll, um, you know, more people think that this is a matter of urgency. But I think we're all um, surprised. Um, to see that there are people who think that this should be left to the market. Um, I certainly am. Um, so as you close, um, could you reflect on those um, poll results and, and what they mean for us as we, you know, um, talk about the urgency of designing a new social contract for the digital age? And I'll start with Jamira and work my way back this way. I mean, well, the thing about data is, right, is who you ask and how you ask the question. So a part of me is disappointed that that many people said leave it up to the market, but I would be curious if it was reflective of the professions in the room, right, and who are they, or these are the people who are leading these markets, these institutions that are like, of course, leave it up to me, or is it the young people who are saying, yeah, we don't trust you, let's reevaluate who actually has the power to make those decisions. Thank you. Uh, Sanjoy? Markets do have a role to play. It is a... Uh, you know, if you talk about data, if you talk about uh, usage of data, and someone raised a very relevant question about uh, it is not data itself, it is how you're using the data, how you're innovating with the data. And innovation, yes, is going to be spurred by markets. So I'm not disappointed by people who say that markets will have a role to play, but that does not obviate the role of the other participants who are very important parts of the social contract which you're talking about. Mm -hmm they also will need to keep on engaging with companies which are engaged in the markets to, to modify their contract. Enrique? Well, I think this will depend on uh, country by country. And I can, I can imagine a moment when we treat, I mean, we already treat access to the internet, broadband, as, as a right in some, in some countries, uh, because we look at poverty in a multidimensional way. So if you don't have access to the pub, you're considered to be relatively poor in the UK compared to your neighbors well, access to the internet, and at some point it might be access to social media. That's your new way of socializing, and so if Facebook wants to enter the UK or Europe or, or the US, they might be told, well, that's a service you cannot withdraw. And that's the deal. That's the social contract between Facebook and the government, and, uh, and, and that would be a new social contract. We would treat it as a, as a right. Lex? Well, I think I agree with everything that, that, that's been said. And, and to return once again to, to, to Sanjoy's initial point, it's a contract with whom? Right? And I think one of the reasons why you had so many people vote for this third option is because we don't trust to create a contract with the same people who have been excluding and, and leaving out and, and self-dealing uh, within the political order uh, that dominates the world today. The nation state system is the system that Europe produced in the 18th and 19th centuries, and, and that's the one we live in today. But we shouldn't just accept it. If we're going to have a new social contract, it should be done in a new way with different centers of power, with different expectations for a different century. And so that brings me to my final uh, question. Uh, closing thought, uh, what's the one thing we can do to achieve this new uh, social contract? One thing. I'll start with you. Uh, one thing we can do is educate ourselves about new forms of democracy, because I think if if there is one promising thing citizens can do today, it's knowing that they can take more power into their hands directly. Enrique? We need to research, we need to study these new forms Education. of democracy to find out what, what actually works for us, for Peru, for Argentina, for Tunisia, for Morocco, for the US. Educate yourself, adapt. Uh, Sanjoy? I think the internet is a great thing. And the one thing I would keep on saying is we need more of global governance to have a universal internet. The problem is we are not doing that. We are now breaking down our conversations. Countries are not talking to each other on this, on fundamental aspects of how the internet is to be governed. 
Internet. If you want to keep it alive, that is one fundamental conversation we need to take. Internet governance. Jamira, we have to center change by putting um, most marginalized people at the center, meaning we have to go to the darkest corners of this earth, talk to people who don't have access to Internet, who still don't have access to running water, and create solutions that will benefit them, that will trigger up to those who are the most privileged in our society. Thank you. Jamira, Enrique, Sanjoy, Lex, thank you very much. This has been a most interesting conversation. It's been an honor to uh, moderate this uh, panel. And you've been incredibly generous with your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now break oh, for okay. coffee Sorry, and reconvene like at 5.30. We will Sorry. reconvene at 5.30. <laughs> thank you. Mind.